Hello guys, uh, I'll make a series on arrhythmias since it's a very complex topic to grasp. So my basic first video will focus on the mechanisms of arrhythmia and why do we have it and basically the definition of arrhythmia followed by focused on specific arrhythmias such as AFib, refib, what to do, when to do, why to do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So let us start. So what is an arrhythmia when it comes to your mind? Well, it's a complex answer, but I'll try to simplify. So basically, the rhythm of the heart is normally generated and regulated by the pacemaker cells within the SA node. Oh, sheesh. Ah. Sorry. Yeah, within the SA node, okay? Which is located within the wall of the right atrium. Uh, SA node pacemaker activity normally governs governs the rhythm of the atria and the ventricles. Basically, it controls the rhythm of the atria and the ventricles. And there's very minimal cyclic fluctuation. So always the atrium contracts first, then the ventricle. When this rhythm becomes uh, irregular, too fast or too slow, tachycardia, bradycardia, this is called an arrhythmia. So when there's an alteration in the conduction pathway, an alteration in the heart rate, alteration in the normal sinus rhythm in which the atrium contracts first, then the ventricle, you can call it an arrhythmia. So what are the clinical symptoms of arrhythmia? Let's say, sorry, yeah. Clinical symptoms of arrhythmia. In any sort of arrhythmia, we have always decreased cardiac output apart from the sinus arrhythmia in which we have a increased heart rate which causes increased cardiac output all of them basically pathological arrhythmias causes decreased cardiac output because there's no effective contraction so when there's decreased cardiac output what will the patient feel let's say syncope obviously palpitation For some arrhythmias, a skipped beat might be sensed because the subsequent uh, beat produces a more forceful contraction and a thumping sensation in the chest. For instance, let's say if we have ectopic beats, we have technically skipping of beats. And in these ectopic beats, we have a strong contraction, which can be sensed in the, uh, which can be sensed, right? So when we come to the causes of arrhythmias, what really causes arrhythmias? Why do we really have it? A fre frequent cause of arrhythmias can be Let's say myocardial infarction. Why? Let's say this is the heart again. Sorry. We have a ventricle here. Okay. So let's say if you have a myocardial infarction here, right? So technically a sodium potassium uh, pump stop working. That means we have an increased uh, positive electrical membrane potential. This can also cause arrhythmias. They become depolarized which leads to two things, altered impulse formation or altered impulse conduction. Now, what do you mean by these things? I'll come to it. So altered impulse conduction is when we have an alteration in the conduction pathways, okay? Uh, either the purocranian cells or let's say the his bundle it undergoes ischemia over there. And obviously, we would probably lead to a left bundle branch block, for instance, or a right bundle branch block, or let's say many other different types of blocks, okay? And an altered impulse conduction, that's quite uh, complex to understand. It is also related to a mechanism of automaticity. I'll come to it. So let's go to the mechanisms of arrhythmias. Where are we? Yeah. So the mechanisms of arrhythmias can be divided into three different uh, subtypes. We have increased automaticity, which is which is caused by altered impulse conduction, or altered impulse formation. Then we have trigger activity, which is early after depolarization and delayed after depolarization. And we have obviously a re-entry mechanism, which could be, which could be divided into AVRT and AVNRT. AV re-entrant uh, tachycardia 
or AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So I'll explain each of this one minute. Mm. So let's say when we have, I'll just erase this so it makes it easier for you guys. Okay. So let's take the pacemaker cell of the heart, right? SA node. We know the heart has three phases, phase zero, sorry, phase four, then phase zero, then phase three. And obviously, again, it repeats, right? Over here, we have something called persistent depolarization. So for instance, when do we have increased automaticity? I would give you a really good example. Let's say myocardial ischemia. Now we know our ventricle cell has uh, an action potential curve of something different. It has a plateau phase. So let's say this is phase zero, then phase one, then phase two, three, and four, right? Now what if I mess up the cell, like I have an ischemia? This is my cell, sodium, potassium, ischemia, this pump stops working, so this has more positive ions inside, right? And since we have more positive ions inside, we will have something called persistent depolarization, right? So how will your action potential gradient look? This causes increased automaticity. Because of this, we have increased automaticity, which can re result in increased arrhythmia. And this is the one which really results. Because of this mechanism, we have formation of ectopic pacemakers. You might be wondering, what is an ectopic pacemaker? So basically, when our SA node stops working, uh, the heart tries to compensate by enabling different pacemakers. Let me just uh, give you a brief example. For instance, we know that our SA node and AV node follows this curve in which we have increased automaticity. But the rest of the conduction pathway, sorry, yeah, rest of the conduction pathway and the ventricular muscles follow this curve in which we have four phases, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if that gets messed up, we will have production of an ectopic pacemaker. Obviously, even if the SA node gets me messed up, but we'll have the same curve over here. But if the rest gets messed up, we'll have this formation in which you have a pacemaker activity of the cell. Hope it makes it clear. If you have any questions, you can obviously type it below and I'm ready to answer. Hmm. Next one, trigger activity. So what is triggered activity? It could be divided into early after depolarization and late, delayed after depolarization, sorry. So let's say we have an upstroke, a normal, normal EAD and DAD, okay. So we have an upstroke, okay. And in an upstroke, we have a opening, opening of sodium channels then we have opening potassium channels, opening of calcium channels, and then obviously closing of calcium channels and continued opening of potassium channels. So we have a plateau phase over here, right? So now, if there's disturbance in this channel, for instance, if the calcium channels don't uh, close, for instance, okay, at this point, it can lead to what? An early after depolarization, because it's not closing, right? So we have more electrical activity. However, if the potassium channels don't close here, it can lead to, we don't have a complete depolarization. It can lead to delayed after depolarization. So your graph would look something like this. Can you see here? So technically, we don't have a complete uh, repolarization of the cell. And there's an electrical activity here, which causes uh, 
formation of which causes consequent depolarization which can result in tachycardia so what is the what is what are the factors that causes early after depolarization a very good example is hypoxia hypothermia uh acidosis uh, hypokalemia and uh, yeah the and anything that causes basically electrolyte deep, deep abnormalities so why do these factors cause early after depolarization simple let's say we have just increased accumulation of calcium ions in your cell which can cause early after depolarization also drugs is a very important cause of early after depolarization a very good uh, example you might have heard of is torsalcipones in which it blocks somewhere the potassium channels over here right and eventually we will have technically something like this twisting around the points causing early after depolarization coming back to delayed after depolarization so what causes uh, delayed after depolarization is just basically to do with let's say digoxin toxicity or catecholamine surge which can basically cause delayed after depolarization okay next one Mm, I would talk about now AVRT and AVNRT. Okay, so let's start. So the rest, the next mechanism is re-entry mechanism. So let's say we have our AV node, right? A slow pathway. Sorry for the drone. Quite bad. And our fast pathway. Okay, so a fast pathway has a longer refractory rate. However, slow pathway has a shorter refractory rate. The question is why? Because all the channels are activated in this faster, and as we know that if if a nerve fiber has a high conduction, right? rapid conduction rapid depolarization it takes a longer time for it to really uh, be completely repolarized compared to a slower uh, nerve conduction pathway in which it takes time to depolarize so there are not many channels being activated right okay so let's see what really triggers a reentry mechanism to happen in av or in let's say av and rt basically if we have an ischemia somewhere around the conduction pathway or along the conduction pathway we can have a slow pathway formation altered impulse conduction automaticity is altered impulse formation just trying to compare different things okay so what really triggers uh, a reentry mechanism to happen obviously we need a trigger which causes a slow pathway to form or it could be the congenital right and the other trigger is formation of let's say a premature atrial atrial complex or premature ventricular complex which basically triggers an altered uh, altered reentry mechanism i'll just explain it further but i need a new page for it So for instance this is our AV node uh we have an impulse coming down i would label this as let's say sorry fast pathway slow pathway yeah okay and we have a slow pathway going down very slowly Use another color. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. So let's say this gets uh, depolarized faster, right? Eventually, it will have a high refract. Uh, it will have a longer refractive period. Uh, 
Now, for instance, we have a PAC coming, prematurated complex. This will also get depolarized, but obviously it has a slower refractive period. So by the time this slow pathway reaches this, it takes time for it to reach. This will already recover from its refractive period. Recovery from refractive period. And obviously then it re-enters to depolarize it. And then we have circular ectopic tachycardia in which we have just ectopic centers being produced. Then coming back to the other one, AVNRT, sorry, AVRT. Let's say this is the heart. AVRT follows a similar mechanism, but it's a bit different. It typically happens in which condition? Wool Parkinson White syndrome. So we have a bundle of Kentia, for instance. This conducts rapidly. Then we have an AV node here. This conducts slowly. Why doesn't this conduct? Simple, because it's not on. It can't conduct uh, an action potential. Okay. There's an elastic tissue that prevents the conduction from really uh, going from the AV node to the ventricle. So the only pathway it can go through is the, I mean, not from the AV node, from the uh, atrium to the ventricle. So the only pathway it can go through is the AV node. And then we have a conduction pathway here. Now, for instance, we have a bundle of Kent, which allows, which is a conductile, uh, conductive tissue, which allows uh, action potential to pass through this, this pathway. Okay. So I will come to another page because it's quite full. Or I could either erase this. It makes sense. Yeah. So now, for instance, let's say we have an action potential. Okay, let's say a PSE. The pathway will go through this, right? And then, boom. This could happen, right? Number one. This is orthodromic. Orthodromic could also happen like this. It forms a re-entered loop, right? Now, what is antidromic? Basically, when your ventricle starts to depolarize, let's say in premature ventricle complex, it forms a widened QRS complex, right? It takes because the muscle takes time to depolarize, so you need a wide QRS complex. It's not your conductive tissue. So then it can enter through the AV node, and then it can be antidromic. So we have two things to consider. Here we know, don't look at Orthodromic is when it goes forward. So an impulse can either go from here and then re-entry or it can go from here and probably re-entry. Yeah. The two pathways. Then the next one is antidromic. Heart, heart, AV node. So we have depolarization from here. Hits the bundle of Kent. Could come like this. Or the impulse conduction go, could go like this. At the end, and it's anticlockwise. So how would it look? Okay. This one, and typically Wolf Parkinson syndrome, we will have a P wave which has a really shorter duration because it skips the AV node. Basically, you're depolarizing it faster, right? Then you're depolarizing the atrium faster. Sorry. Then we have a delta wave. Why do we have a delta wave? Because our ventricle is depolarized faster due to a bundle of Kent and a widened QRS complex. 
So the typical feature of a Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is short PR, delta wave, and widen QRS complex. That's it. Okay, guys, if you have any questions, uh, I'm ready to answer. Uh, and I will, I think so. I made a few mistakes, but I will correct it soon. Like, yeah, that's it. Thank you. See you. Goodbye.